And if you want to take 30 seconds just to stand up and shake your limbs off, now's a really good time, because I know that, uh, you know, please don't go away. Can we get the uh, hand signal going? Um, so we're going to be getting you to do lots and lots of different bits and bobs during this session, um, and some of them will involve you talking to each other, and it might get noisy. In the event that we want to bring the group to order, the idea is we put our hands up, please put your hand up and stop talking. The, the second part of, of that is critical. <laughs> and stop talking. It doesn't always work that way. So Judy and I were, were preparing. In fact, Judy, Judy's the famous one. She did this talk in Venice recently, and I thought, you know what, that's it. It's nailed, dead easy, no preparation. We sat down to have a look at it, and for about 40 minutes, we were discussing the meaning of the word trust. And it was like, oh crap, we've got half an hour to do this. So we completely rewrote it. So, first, in the privacy of your own mind, I'm curious to know, for you, building, remote, building trust in remote teams is like what? Now, some of you will know my background is in clean language. And yes, this session does include some practical applications of clean language, which I hope will spark your curiosity. Our overall goal for this session is that you will leave with more questions than answers. But just to get started, we'll, we'll warm up slowly. Um, in a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand up and have a conversation with one other person, possibly two. It's not critical in this instance. How do you know when you have trust in your remote team or team of teams. Or indeed, don't have trust. Indeed. Please stand up, talk to someone near you, or if this is an opportunity to move, just grab a minute, just talk to people about that. So, do you have remote teams? No, no. no. we just started to have remote teams, so this is very interesting. One in Ukraine, one in Belgrade. Ukraine and Belgrade. Yeah, Belgrade. Belgrade. So, yeah. yeah. And grab a seat. <laughs> we start by giving you our answers. The promise in the program, if anybody saw that bit of the program, was that you would have in this session three ways to build trust in remote teams. There are three ways to build trust in remote teams. This is the quick version. So, quite simple. Have conversations in which everyone can be seen and heard. Turn your cameras on. Why is that? controversial sometimes. I don't know, it is. But we're embodied beings. We need to see each other and hear each other. So the hygiene of good comms, see each other and hear each other. Um, it's important. It's in there. It's at the front. We won't spend too long on it because um, we've got bigger things to do. Um, secondly, ask well-directed questions. You won't be surprised to know that's going to be some clean questions. And we've got a very specific recommendation we want you to experiment with. And um, finally, in the wrong order, we'll come to that, really listen to the answers, come with curiosity. Something Geeta said earlier that resonated strongly with me is be your authentic self and let curiosity be part of that authenticity and you are on the road towards trust in extended teams. That first point there needs saying out loud because I'm doing a lot of work at the moment with uh, remote teams and about remote meetings and remote high-quality training and high-quality agile facilitation in distributed contexts, I know how much this needs saying. Have conversations in which everybody can be heard and seen. How many people occasionally attend a, high, a meeting where some people are in the room together, some people are remote, and you can't hear everybody. A few? Just, uh, let's just see a show of hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, guys. It's 2019. Get the tech sorted out. Get people heard and seen. And also, behind that, there's a critical factor of people feeling confident and safe to be heard and seen. So trust, huge subject. We're going to narrow in on some small bits here. But trust, psychological safety, authenticity, are all strongly overlaid with each other. And we could get into a whole discussion about why psychological safety is damaged when you don't have the level playing field of everybody being seen. If you possibly can, don't have that hybrid meeting set up. 
One remote, all remote. It just works. And well-directed questions. Yes. Steve. Asking well-directed questions. Um, Do you want to have the zapper? Hmm? Have the zapper. <laughs> what am I doing? Push that one, and it changes the slide. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm a literature graduate, OK. I'm going I'm to own up now. I, I, you know, I was at Manchester in, in the 1980s as, as a student. Um, I'm going to say I thought computer scientists were just the slightly weird ones. I was wrong. You're really weird. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, impressive. OK, four dislocations in remote teams. Um, I don't think it's controversial, the dislocations of time, space, culture, embodiment. What I mean by that is trust is hard enough to get in co-located teams. Why is it harder to get in distributed teams? And I think that these four factors are worth considering on a template of the challenges with remote teams, distributed teams everywhere. Time. Time of day, your morning, their evening. It makes a dislocation of work practice, communication, wakefulness, ability to talk. It makes things a bit harder. Space, whether in the next building, the next continent, the next country, you've got physical space between you. It's just another challenge to overcome. Perhaps as signi more significantly than all of these is that of culture. And I think that you, well, I invite you to consider culture. The obvious one is the, um, you know, the, the cross team between the, the Lithuanians and, and the Indians, the uh, Americans and, and the French. Culture can actually just be two different teams in the same building. It, it, it's pretty significant, these microcultures that we talk about. So, and that will make what you intended and what is heard potentially harder. Add all those in together and... and <laughs> We actually spent many, most of the material for today is on the cutting room floor, because we only had half an hour. There was hours and hours of conversation about what creates culture, team, bonding, listening, authenticity. Culture was significant, an embodiment when we bring our own bodies, right, fourth one. People often talk about the desire and will to read body language in a room. And often people think it's only in the room you can do that. I, I absolutely disagree, I think you can do it when you turn the cameras on and you've got uh, engagement but it is a fourth challenge that makes it harder. So there's the four dislocations. And swiftly into what we're going to talk about today, one of the pieces of uh, advice I'd like to experiment with is uh, we call this going from, from gray to green. And here's a new model for you, possibly. Well, uh, in fact, I'm damn sure it is. We only wrote it yesterday. <laughs> um, where green is the known and uh, what I'm going to call light black is the unknown. And then there's that light gray in the middle, the partially known. Now, I think when you are placing well-directed questions, remember authenticity, remember curiosity. When you are placing well-directed questions, and this is one of the things we're going to recommend to you, and we've got some questions to try. When you've got the added complications of time, space, culture, embodiment, probably it's safer to go into the partially known. Aim for the edge of what you think you know about other people in your team, as opposed to diving off into the dark. There are times and spaces when you may want to dive off into the dark, uh, but that's a different day, a different talk. For now, we're gonna say practice on the partially known with the intention of, click. I got it wrong. We changed the order of the slides, didn't we? Um, in the unknown, there'd be dragons, pirates, good things, bad things. It's all fantasy, OK? It's the subject of another day. Next click. Bugger. It's not the <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hand over. I'll let Judy explain. Experiments, Experiment. experiments. Yeah. <laughs> it's more interesting this way, isn't it? It's about growing the circle. Yeah. Yeah. So the purpose of the slide is to indicate that you're making it all up. The stuff you don't know about your colleagues. You might be making up that they're all sweetness and light. You might be making up that they're all awful. But you are making it up in the unknown. And given the four dislocations of time, space, culture, and embodiment, you are likely to know less about people you don't meet in person frequently. Uncontroversial? So that's where we're going. We're going to... The light grey, because that's 
in, indeed, this gadget will have a little thing in me, won't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> We're aiming for the light grey, which is the place where you know the most about what you don't know. And that's a great place to direct a question. And in this next activity, you're going to be directing some questions. It's a clean language-based activity. And it starts with this question. For you, building trust in remote teams is like what? Now, the answer to that was going to be different for everybody. It might be the kind of building which is like building a multi-story car park out of blocks of concrete. It might be like uh, cooking a cake. It might be like step by step. It might be like a journey. Whatever it is for you is the right answer. But to do the next activity, you'll need an answer. Just make something up. It's not important. Because it can develop, and in fact, it probably will. So that's the starting question. There are then going to be two questions that you can use. And some of you, if not all of you, will have a little card with these questions on. The two questions are, what kind of X, and is there anything else about X, where X represents one or more of the other person's words? So in this activity, you're going to be in pairs, and the first person is going to be the answerer, and the second person is going to be the question asker. Super fast demo. Super fast demo. So, I'm the question asker. Steve is the question answerer. For you, building trust in remote teams is like what? Uh, it's, it's like an episode of Star Wars. What kind of episode? You've got the dark side, you've got the bright side, you've got the Jedi, um, you've got to look for the good in other people despite time and space. And is there anything else about the good in other people? It's always there if you're curious, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's well disguised. And is there anything else about the light side? That's us. Mm -hmm. And what kind of dark side? Uh, the dark side's also us. Um, it's, <laughs> it's kind of, of in all of us, and it's about being curious and allowing people to be authentic and knowing that what you intended isn't necessarily what lands and being okay with that. And you'll probably be timed up by that time, because there'll be time just a couple of minutes each way. This time it does want to be in pairs rather than threes. If there are any leftover people, we'll get Steve to stand in as an extra partner. <laughs> What did you notice? You spoke more. Thought more. More animated. Spoke more, thought more, more animated. More, more, more. Who's different to that or similar? Who's got something different? Who had a different experience? You have to make up more rubbish. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so you plumped for an analogy, you then started to regret it, and you didn't really want to 
follow through with that analogy. So it was just a little bit of fun. It was only, I think you had less than two minutes per turn, so hopefully that wasn't too uncomfortable. Um, but generally speaking, it sounded as if there were some lively conversations going on. And I know some of you will have met these questions before. Who encountered them for the first time in this session? Thank you. That's interesting. And it strikes me that it's interesting because we're not really used to asking these kind of questions. They go a little bit deep, a little bit quickly. And maybe they're a little bit uncomfortable. But they're most comfortable if they are directed to the partially known. If they're directed to the known, then they're boring. You're just talking about stuff you already know. If they're directed into the dark gray, the outside edges, you might be talking about stuff you really don't want to talk about or stuff that you don't know much about. But when you direct your questions to the gray, to the light gray circle there, then it grows, the area of the known grows, and the area of the partially known grows. And the area of the dark gray, the completely unknown, becomes, does it become smaller? I think that's one for discussion over a beer or two. <laughs> one thing I'd say from my experience is uh, these questions work cross-culturally. So in terms of looking at distributed teams, a nice little advantage to throw in with the clean language questions is, and I just spent 18 years working with international NGOs in risk management, I know that they work cross-culturally because you're inviting somebody else to, to talk in a way that, that is, just, get, just works, just gets in. Um, that's one observation. The second, um, in fear of moderately contradicting, the known, there are a lot of presuppositions in there that might be wrong. Uh, and actually playing with the known and discovering it's not quite as known as you thought it was is, is pretty significant as well. So, how do you know where the grey is? I've remembered, good. I had a moment of panic there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the clue was on the slide, thankfully. Uh, listen. It's that piece about um, talking about bringing curiosity, particularly, and it's something um, Snowden said this morning that, I mean, I was just so, I've got pages of notes from that conversation, um, or, or, or it'll become a conversation. The three to five percent, remember that bit about what we uh, perceive in the world, three to five percent, yeah, we, we take in that, and then the other 95 percent comes from our experience and, and rapid stuff. Pretty interesting, eh? Um, and it chimes with my experience. I think that if you choose to listen more than that, I don't, I, I'm not here to, to uh, discuss it with Dave, and hopefully that'll be over a beer later, but I think you can uh, imp increase that if you, choose to, if you choose to listen. And paying attention is the answer. We're gonna come on to another model shortly, but for now, we're going straight into the next exercise. <laughs> Okay, this is um, a quick exercise. Who's got a mobile phone with them, anybody? I know the entire front row's got one. They're only using them. <laughs> um, they're, they're live tweeting our talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay, so this is a um, quick exercise. Again, it's pairs. What I would like you to do, speaker and listener. Speaker, I would like you to talk about something that you've got a bit of passion about, something you care about, something you're interested in. Could be about today, could be about your hobby, anything at all. Speaker, talk about something you're interested in. Listener, I want you to listen. Don't want you to talk, please. I please the invitation, just, just listen in an engaging way. Eye contact, pay attention. Until I put my hand up. At which point, what I'd like you to do, please, is to become visibly distracted. A really good technique is to start checking your mail in the conversation. Talker, keep talking. I'll put my hand up again. Listener, re-engage. Put your phone away, re-engage. We're gonna do that two ways round and then talk about it. Are you ready? Find someone to talk with? Okay.
and talk. Um, when, um, so yeah, so when he went to train his maths a I think about something that I could say that was going to be actually interesting and useful to a group of varied people. But I tried anyway. Pay attention. Pay attention again to your talker. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I'd like you to uh, swap, just swap roles. And uh, I, 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 hand didn't really work, did it? So I'll, I'll, I'll just clap and Judy will jump about. <laughs> okay, change. We've been talking about Liverpool Football Club, so top of the league at the moment. We're eight points clear. This first pair of TV yesterday, which was okay. <laughs> uh, which was good, actually. So he was um, a little bit underdeveloped, um, so we were worried that. And that's why I'm here. Um, I get sent over from Atlanta uh, as recruiting as we're cross pollinating communities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Take a seat. Talkers, what did you notice when your listener was distracted? What happened? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, so, so you're one of those many people, like myself, who, are, who tend to stop talking when you get direct eye contact, so actually, or even when someone's looking at you. So for some people, it's more comfortable when the other person looks away. I'm going to bet that that's the, le the less frequent response within the audience, but it certainly is a relevant one and an important yeah. one. Who had a similar or a different experience? You don't want to talk when someone's not listening, so what did you do instead? I stopped people, kept talking, but it's uncomfortable. It felt like I'm wasting my time. It felt uncomfortable, like you're wasting your time. I actually stumbled on the floor, flying 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 on the floor. So you stumbled, you stopped. I found that that's just taking away people. I'm trying to bring people in. So trying to attract their attention back by gesticulating. Anything else people tried? <laughs> so you're saying stuff about her to attract her attention, and Chris? I'm surprisingly good at listening, even if I'm looking at my phone. Ah, so you were good at listening, even if you were looking at your phone. But who were you listening to? Who was your partner? Massimo. So what was your experience when Chris was distracted? So why are you talking with him? Just might as well not bother. Even though Chris thinks that he was listening just as well when he was looking at his phone. Yeah. yeah, he caught him repeating himself. So this is interesting, isn't it? Even though Chris thinks, Chris knows indeed, can evidence. He's lived the experience. He he's knows. had the lived experience that he can listen just as well when he's playing with his phone. It's not Massimo's experience that he's being listened to in that situation. Hmm. But this is the interesting bit, that people respond to the impression that the other person is distracted, not necessarily to the fact that the other person is distracted. And the quality of your listening can determine the quality of another person's thought. This, my favorite quote from Nancy Klein, I think, just says it all, really. Your listening can determine the quality of another person's thoughts. And with all of that, we're probably on time. Ooh. Can I have 30 seconds we have 30 slide? seconds? Yeah. 30 seconds. I spoke earlier about um, the sequence of things and how things were out of sequence at the front end, and it was to do with this model. We started primarily with guiding attention, which was the guiding attention questions. And then we moved into the right, well, how do you know if they're listening? And that was the paying attention. So this is a sequence that's at the root of a lot of the joint thinking Judy and I are doing and developing into different areas. 
and it's a cycle that's wants to introduce, and it'll work for remote teams and, and co-located teams. Start here. Start with the paying attention and listening. And it's about what the other person gets, not, not actually about, about what you intended. It's about what they get and, and being curious about what they get, turning up the authenticity. And listen first. And when you listen and smell and see and notice the gaps between things, it puts you in a frame where you can guide attention to the right kind of area for both of you that could be about directing, developing trust or developing a product or both. Then you can go into the speaking up phase and that's where the magic lies. And we're re really, I'm really easy to find online. Steve's quite easy to find online. There's Reece nothing there for me. <laughs> <laughs> ReeseMcCann.com is where you can find our, our joint website, which is our sort of corporate website. Um, if you want to find out more about, uh, if you want to read my blog, sign up for my link letter, judyreese.co.uk um, is the place you find that stuff. I also want to mention this article series for InfoQ that I curated um, over the recent weeks. Five really excellent articles about different aspects of remote meetings. We started off talking to the editor-in-chief of InfoQ about one article, and when we talked about all the different subjects, we got some of the world's greatest experts to write about those topics. So do have a look at that if you haven't already seen it. And it's free. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask you to do this activity, but as we close, you might want to consider what's one tip that you'll give to someone else as a result of having been in this session. Thank you. Thank you.